Welcome to P3, I'm Randall Mark. This is a show that explores the fascinating people, places, and perspectives that make up our world. On today's show is Big Brother Watching You. We talk about surveillance, safety, and fear. And then later on, I get a chance to get tennis serving lessons from Wimbledon champ, Venus Williams. Stick around, it's gonna be a great show. Almost everywhere we turn, we're told to watch out, be careful, don't let your kids out of your sight. Professor Matt Hearn, author of Watch Yourself, Why Safer Isn't Always Better, says we live in a culture of fear that is undermining our ability to solve our own problems and instead pushes us to rely on the state for almost everything. He joins me in the studio. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks for having me. This is an interesting book. Uh, I was reading it and uh, having kids. This idea of fear and uh, the culture of fear is all around us. We're told, be careful, don't let your kids do this and that. You say surveillance, cameras everywhere, is not necessarily good. Why? Well, it's an interesting question. You know, and I started with a very basic kind of thought when I started thinking about this book. And I was thinking, because I grew up on Vancouver Island, and uh, after, grade, after school in grade one, like every other kid in my class, I would walk home from school. It was about three miles, and I would walk. It would take me about, you know, maybe an hour sometimes, sometimes more. Sometimes I'd poke around. And I realized that every other kid in my class was doing that. Uh, same, too, and nobody seemed to worry about that. Now, my parents still live in the same area of Vancouver Island, and I would never let my kid, when she was six years old, walk right. there. Let alone now, my youngest daughter's 12. I would never let my 12-year-old daughter walk three miles by herself through the countryside. And I would probably be considered a bad parent if I did. Yeah, if you just let her, you'd be like, what's, pro- what's the problem yeah. with you, right? And so there was something that just happened there. I went, well, hang on a sec. I know my daughter is certainly more responsible and more capable than I was. Right. So how come have things shifted so much? Right. Is there there's that much more crime? Are kids getting abducted more? No, and the answer is no. The, the, no. So the stats, there's, they're, they're not. We are actually live in a safer society, you're saying. That's correct. Um, so, so what's going on then? Well, that's, that's the book. That's what I was trying to figure out. I was trying to trace that, and I was trying to figure out what exactly were, you know, what is the trajectory that is forcing people to think towards uh, increasing the amount of surveillance, increasing the amount of monitoring, and decreasing the capacity of everyday people, not just kids, but adults as well, to make their own decisions. That's the key, I think, when you said that. You said there, the downline of this, the downline of surveillance, the downline of taking care of all your kids and everything, is that it now my autonomy, my ability to make choices is diminished. Is that, what, is that right? I think that's part of it, and I think that's true for a lot of us. And so I was, uh, just a very simple example now, in Vancouver now, they're stationing police officers by bike paths, mm-hmm. and they're giving people tickets if they don't wear their helmets. Mm-hmm. And so, to me, that strikes me as very strange in lots of ways. So I think wearing a bike helmet's a good idea. Okay. I think it's a good idea, and it seems like pretty much indisputable. But do we really need a nanny state pouring over me? So if they're going to watch me, put it, whether I put on a helmet and give me a fine if I, if I don't wear it, what's next? Are they going to come and check to see if I floss tonight? Are they going to come and see that I did enough exercises? Because those are surely as important to my health as wearing a bike helmet. So, but the, the idea, I mean, the, the argument against that is to say, listen, we realize that wearing a bike helmet is good. Seat belts are good. We have, you know, seat belt checks. Are you saying, listen, let people ride their bike if they don't want to wear a helmet? That's their problem? I think in large respect, yeah. And I'm not arguing for just, you know, complete free-for-all. But I think the overwhelming pressure over the last 20 or 30 years in our culture has been pressuring uh pressuring our culture to an increasingly restrictive uh, levels of surveillance and monitoring and supervision. And I think we need to push back the other way pretty consistently and pretty hard. Let's talk about surveillance because that's, I mean, right on the cover you have this uh, great you know, image of the camera. And we've seen this in London, which is increasing now in Vancouver with the 2010 Olympics coming. The idea is that if we just have enough cameras, we'll stop crime. Yeah. And people feel like, oh, it's fine, videotape me anywhere I go. What's the problem with that? Well, it's I'm not doing anything wrong. Yeah. I don't mind being on well, camera. That's exactly, it. and that's the argument that often comes. Oh, you don't like a heavy police you know, uh, presence in your park? Well, if you're not, uh, you know, if you're not selling drugs, what are you worried about? Right. And I, and, and t- I, I get that at some level, right? Uh, so the average citizen of London right now gets caught on closed circuit television uh, upwards of 300 times a day. Wow. So who's who's looking at that, and what are they right. doing exactly? And what does it say about uh, us as a culture when we need to be surveyed constantly? Uh, and I there's parts of it that you know you're gonna go, okay, well. Yeah, whatever, so it's a camera. We all assume we're getting caught on film when we use our, you know, our ATM card or when we go to the bank or something. Mm-hmm. But you start thinking about, where am I not surveyed? And you think about any single place that you go to right now, any public spot. Think about going to the mall. Yeah. Think about going Restaurant. to the library. Yeah. Think about going, not only that, but usually there's a security guard. Okay. 
Okay. And so it's an interesting phenomenon where every single place that you could possibly go into, every single public space, is A, surveyed, and then you start wondering, well, who's watching that camera stuff? You know, who's, mm. who's filming that and what for? What are they watching for? They're but looking also, for bad people. But there's also security guards, right? right. And so you start thinking, it, it carefully begins to move what they call enclosure. It begins to move what has been public or common space into privately owned and monitored and surveyed space. Oh, and then you end up okay. something. So you look at our modern rendition of the town square, which is the mall. Right. And a mall looks public. It feels like a street where you can walk down like a, you know, like a marketplace or yeah. something, but actually it's privately owned. And so, for example, if you're riding a skateboard, you can be thrown out. If you're wearing a T-shirt that is, you know, has, for example, an anti-Iraq war slogan, you can get thrown out. There's all kinds of weird kind of trajectories that it just begins to slowly move a culture towards very odd and strange places. Give me some extreme examples you've come across in your research that you would say that most viewers would go, yeah, that's nuts, I don't want that. But you're saying, look, that's how it got there. Give me some examples. Well, well, let me give you the most basic story, or the the first story that I started really kind of undertaking this research. This is about eight or nine years ago now. Um, But I was working at a school in North Vancouver, uh, a place called Windsor House, and it was a terrific place. Uh, It was a place that explicitly prides itself on the freedom that it gives kids. And we had this beautiful campus uh, at the time. It was a great big campus with all these kind of trees. And kids, little kids, were climbing these trees. And they were quite big, tall trees. And so you'd get little kids climbing way, way up in trees. Mm -hmm. And then we started having a staff discussion. I think it was was, uh, brought on by me, feeling nervous. I was nervous. I was like, well, these kids are way high in the trees. What if they fall? Is that that our problem? Well, exactly. And I started thinking, I was like, okay, so... Should we, you know, give them licenses to climb trees? Should, like, there be a... A, a waiver know, they got to sign? Exactly, or, a staff yeah. person. I was thinking, and then I was thinking how funny that is, right? Well, a staff person underneath, well, they fall, what are you going to catch them? Right. You know? So we were just talking about it, but mostly it was just a normal quasi-parental anxiety. I'm worried about the kids being high in the tree. Our vice principal, halfway through the discussion, she left. And she went and, you know, did a little bit of research while we were having this discussion. And it turns out the year before, at a private school in North Vancouver, a private Waldorf school, it was a terrible tragedy. A, a little girl fell out of a tree and died which was terrible. It's, right. it's the most horrible you know, nightmare ever. In response, the district of North Vancouver banned all tree climbing in North Vancouver. Hmm. So our discussion was actually moot. Kids in North Vancouver on school and municipal property not are not allowed to climb trees. Right. So then you go, hold on for a second. I'm at a school that, that actually takes a lot of time to give a lot of responsibility and a lot of respect to kids, and you're not allowed to climb trees? And we're not t- so that and that's right. a blanket ban. So it's not just the forty foot high oaks. It's actually the little saplings. Kids are not right. le- so. How do we get to a place in our culture where we're going to ban kids from climbing trees? And you're saying that's just one step. If if the state is about quote protecting everybody, then there's nothing we can do that's ever risky ever. That's correct. And we we need an element of risk in our lives as human beings to show that we can overcome things. You need. I mean, my kids. Some of the craziest things they do are risky, and I yeah. they, often they do it when my wife is not around because I'm like, yeah, go ch- try that out. Do the dirt bike jump. But that's the times when they develop character. Right. For sure. And also, I think that people are, there's some inherent need for us to have adventure, to explore, to take risks. And if you keep trying to take it away, people are going to find it in other ways. And, and maybe unhealthy ways. Very, very possibly. Because if there's, and maybe more risky, maybe, you know. So, and you think of, there's all kinds of ways like this, right? So, for example, my youngest daughter was at a, a couple years ago, she was at a horse camp. Yeah. She fell off the horse and broke her arm. It was lousy. It was too bad. Right. But it was, it was okay. So then what's the response? Should, we, should I run around and try to create a commission all across British Columbia to inspect every horse that kids ever ride? Should I ban horse camps? Should I ban little girls from riding horses? Or you just go, yeah. It's a Sometimes great- kids break arms when they're riding horses, and that's okay. And it's a great thing. You should wow. not be banning tree climbing, and you should not be banning kids wow. riding horses. Because- Let's take a break here because there's so much more to talk about. There's, uh, there's a couple of really great quotes in this book, and you have this really fascinating school that you're a part of that gives a ch- kids choice of what they want to learn and what they don't want to learn. They don't have to. I've got to ask you questions about that yet, Matt. Stick around more with Matt Hearn right after this break. Matt Hearn, author of Watch Yourself, Why Safer Isn't Always Better. Matt, uh, this issue, Why Safer Isn't Always Better, you know, you, we meet, give some examples of kids because that's really where people go, what? You, you don't want you to protect your kids, but you're saying, yes, protection's important, but there's other things that are important too, like their autonomy, their choice, their ability to take risks, those kinds of things. Yeah, and we gotta, I think we've got to think about it hard sometimes, but it's a difficult place to be because, like you say, are you going to be the one who's going to be the bad parent? Right. Are you going to be the one who everybody's going to look at and go, oh, my God, Randall? 
You know, he's he just he's he doesn't nuts. he doesn't care he lets about his kids his kid. do anything they right? want, and they're yeah, hurting themselves like exactly. Crazy. And there is something, some part of that where you go, well, the more you take care of your kids, the more I mean, people call that helicopter parenting. That yeah. must mean you're a really good parent, right? Mm. But it is true that if you let kids take risks, sometimes they're going to get hurt. Mm. And isn't and, it, I mean, in our culture, it seems like we're developing a society of people who have a tough time taking risks because the state is is taking all the risk out, and making laws against whatever. Yeah, and I think that's I think you see that in in, in all kinds of ways. I think it comes out in I think it's uh, the pressure points uh, end up expressing them in all kinds of strange ways. And you know this in uh, you know we know this. Just in, in just in terms of the explosive growth of liability and, and insurance stuff, right? right? So people suing each other. People sue each other, but but more than that, all the things that people don't do because they're afraid of liability, right? Mm-hmm. So for example, schools all around North America have banned, for example, all kinds of field trips just because the liability insurance is right. too much to get, right? Um, stuff like tag, stuff like dodgeball is getting banned just because schools don't want to deal with the potential, you know, explosive lawsuits, right? In a particular time when schools and all other kinds of institutions where their budgets are beginning to get crunched, you go, do I want to take a risk? No. I, I just can't afford it. And I know that no. because working with kids. Right. So, you know, I run this little youth center, and I've got, of course, liability insurance for it. But every time we go play hockey in the backyard, right. I think... What if we don't, gets in the face or we something? We don't got coverage for that. Oh, we want to go camping. Do I have coverage for that? Oh, you even want to go and have lunch in the park. What happens if, right? And surely right. that works into, there's, there's a sort of insidious way that all of a sudden our ideas about what's possible get, mm-hmm. keep getting shrunk. Let me give you a brief example yeah. of that. So my grandmother, I, I grew up with my grandma and my parents still live with her. And we live in a quasi-rural area of Vancouver Island. Um, and for years, we had a trampoline in the front yard. Mm-hmm. And it was great. And you know, we would always jump on and stuff. And, then, and kids, and there's not really neighborhood kids, but sometimes people would come. And then somebody told my grandma one time that if a neighborhood kid walked down the street, bounced on the trampoline, hurt themselves, she could get sued. Right. And I don't actually even know if that's really true or even possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, I suspect it might be. But it just started working in my grandma's mind. So every time she looked out at the trampoline, she would just get nervous. And right. all she would see was that in some weird way that she didn't quite get, somebody would sue her and she would lose the house, everything she ever worked for all her wow. life. And we would become, you know, impoverished. <laughs> Wow. And, you know, just from having a trampoline. Totally. And so she just right. got so nervous about right. it that eventually the trampoline went away. Now, I'm not going to make an argument that the trampoline, having a trampoline in my life or my kid's life yeah. is like, you know, hugely important. But you can see how just slowly, you know, possibilities just start getting restricted. And what people think of as possible and what people think about as, you know, potentially viable mm-hmm. just kind of slowly gets crushed, right? And you see, this in, you see this around kids, but you see this around adults all the time too, right? This continual restriction of public spaces, right? And what's possible. So, for example, I was... Um, I was mentioning this earlier, is that there's actually rules on the book in Vancouver, and this sounds absurd, you're not going to believe me, but it's true, is that there's regulations in the book in Vancouver about public parks. There's only three parks in, in the whole city of Vancouver where technically you're allowed to play frisbee or play a guitar outside. What? Guitar is too strenuous? Yeah. Can break my fingers? Uh, no, you disturb other people. Oh, okay. Can't offend anyone That's with right. the music. Same, so, for example, and so I go to, after I finish this interview, I'm going to go to Third Beach mm-hmm. uh, in Stanley Park. Actually, playing ball is outlawed on, on Third Beach. Same as inflatables. Right? And so you just kind of get this endless kind of series of laws, right. restrictions, rules, supervision, monitoring, maintenance. So endless, we just kind of end up with this culture that keeps getting further and rest- further restricted. And like you say, I think what happens then is people end up, they, mm. they look for that risk, they look for that adventure in other ways. Mm. Sometimes unhealthy ways, sometimes weird ways. One, one of the things I wonder is, why are people okay with being, you know, being, you know allowing the state to kind of make all these decisions. How come there's not more of an outcry? Is it? I mean, one of the things I think is: is have people been, I don't know, uh, lulled into just allowing a big brother kind of approach? Like, why, why are people fine with it? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think part of it and is has to do with the difficulty of the argument, and that's really why I wrote the book. Mm-hmm. Is because you say, well, you want to argue against safety. Well, good luck with that. Right, right. It's kind of, and you know, so that's really the core reason I wrote the book is that I noticed not just the, you know, starting with the first argument around climbing trees, but then in all sorts of other places, and some of them tiny, some of them very personal, some of them larger and more public. Even working up to say the war on drugs, the war on terror, mm. you get stuff like, well, hang on a sec, you're monitoring every single email in the United States. Mm. Well, it's a safety thing. It just cuts off conversation. Right. So as soon as you say it's a safety thing, right. it's it a national just, security or something. You exactly. just use that to do anything. It's right. just done. Right. And then all of a sudden, it's a very difficult argument to get out of because, like you say, oh, you're in favor of people getting hurt. Right. You're in favor of crime. And you're like, you're no, in favor I'm not. Children getting but hurt. that's not the that's not the opposite of of surveillance. The other opposite isn't you know uh, you know safety. It's like no, I want I want to I want to have freedom. I want choice. I want these kinds of things. Exactly. That's what you're saying. That's exactly right. And, and exactly, what are we losing when we bit by bit? And so you can say that, for example, kids climbing trees is not that big a deal. But actually, I think we lose a big part when we lose. 
you know, the possibility mm-hmm. of kids running up and climbing a tree. And if you keep adding that up, you end up with a very different culture. Mm-hmm. And part, part of the way these things get moved into, so I use an example often at the Democratic National Convention, which is in 2004, it was in Boston. And I think it's, I think it's germane because of what's going to happen with the Olympics. But so the, it was a Democratic National event, Convention in Boston. It was perceived to be a very obvious terror target. Mm-hmm. So they brought in $35 million worth of cameras and security. They, they just blanketed the, the city of Boston right. in security cams. And they're like, no, no, it's just for the convention. It's just for the DNC. It stayed. Yeah. And then what happened is after the convention, the, the, the police chief, they, they're saying, well, how come they're still here? And the police chief of Boston said, well, look, I got all these expensive cameras. I'm just mm-hmm. not going to put them in a box now. Wow. And I think we need to be really cognizant of that because what's happened, they say, well, it's just the Olympics. There's just security zones. There's just surveillance. There's just all this extra weirdness. Mm. It's just for the Olympics. And it never is. It never stops there. Matt, I got to ask you this because it's really interesting. and My viewers would be fascinated by it. You're part of an alternative school to public school in B.C., and yet it gives kids choice on what courses they want every week, whether they want to be in class, whether they not. Do, is that is that? Tell me the model in thirty seconds, and is that the, is that the kind of freedom that you want kids to have? Uh, I think it's, it's something I'm very interested in. So I've been involved, and in, you'll recognize this as maybe there's aspects of the homeschooling movement like this, there's aspects of alternative schools like this, but and there's quite a bit like the the uh, the East Center I run called the Purple Thistle. The school you're talking about is called Windsor House. It's in North Vancouver. It's a publicly funded free. Uh, it's, well, they call it a democratic free school. Okay. But really, what the entire kind of idea around democratic school movement tries to take seriously is the idea that kids can make choices well and responsibly from a very young age. And so I guess a big part of that, too, in my argument around unschooling or de-schooling as a larger kind of structure is that if we take kids from the age of 5 to 17 and we put them in institutions, compulsory schools, where we offer them very little opportunity to make any real choices for themselves, any choices about what they learn, when they learn, when they eat their own lunch, when they go to the bathroom, what sequence they learn things, what things they're interested in, then how can we expect them to be really interested, engaged, and responsible citizens when they leave school at age 18? Wow, so they're just, they're just following whatever they're told to do, and, and they have nothing. Well, Matt, clearly we've got to have you on again, because I'm so interested in that issue. I've got kids, and I think that's a big issue that's going on in our society. We're right at a time, Matt. Your book is interesting. I want people to pick it up. It's a great argument. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, Matt. Thanks a lot for having me. Great, you bet. Next up on P3, I get a tennis lesson and talk about life with one of the world's most successful and famous tennis players, Venus Williams. Venus Williams is one of the most successful tennis players in history. With five Wimbledon championships and scores of Grand Slam victories to her credit, she is a major part of the new Grand Slam tennis video game being produced by Electronic Arts. I recently had a chance to meet up with this athletic superstar and she even gave me tennis lessons. Yeah, I've done a little surfing. Okay, I'll let you do okay. what you do and then we'll go through. Okay, okay. So, split pointed? Yes. Good. There you go. Okay. No, it didn't go over the net. It so. didn't go over the net because you got to use your legs a little more. This foot should be landing pretty much into the court. You know, am I twisting my body? Like, no. Okay. Um, so what you're going to do is use your legs more, yeah. and jump into the court, and get your shoulders all the way through. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Nice. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. If I could do that every time, I'd be like a machine. <laughs> There's a spirituality about you that's very evident that gives you strength. Do you, oh, you, wow. do you attribute so. that to you? To yeah, that? What's I, that about? I definitely had a really strong spiritual background growing up and still do. And um, definitely keeps me balanced and helps me realize, okay, tennis is my career, but it's not my life. And it's um, not my main goal in my yeah. life. So it keeps it balanced when in, in this sport that's really all-consuming. So mm-hmm. um, it helps me keep my perspective. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, you uh, most people understand that you're Jehovah Witness, and that this is an important part of your soul. And, and that, I think that translates onto the court. 
Right, I'm not Jehovah's Witness yet. We have to study. And, yeah. And yeah, how does that work as far as, but the study that you do? Because you say like three days a week, this is an important part of you. Uh, how does that translate onto the court? Well, when I'm at home, I go. To, I try to go to service two days a week. And, mm. you know, I like to wake up and read my Bible. Mm -hmm. and I enjoy it and... Um, you know, my goal is to be a teacher one day. And wow. So, yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, I have to, a, lot, a lot to I learn. I love that. But, you know, That's something so unique because most people just think, oh, you're just, just in this sport. Yeah. But you're obviously this well-rounded person that uh, engages life in a very whole way. How do you inspire kids these days? Wow. Um, inspiring kids, I think, just being able to spend time with them, um, doing clinics and things like that. And uh, hopefully them seeing me play in, on the matches, um, hopefully displaying a positive attitude when I'm on the court. Hopefully goes a long way. Yeah. Last question, Dennis. Uh, you were clothing line, EA, you know, you got this great game, uh, got all your accomplishments. For you, where when you're done your career in tennis, where are you gonna go? Oh, uh, where am I gonna go? Um, you know, I just hopefully I'll take a break <laughs> after I'm finished playing yeah. because um, I just when you're a tennis player you just work non-stop hmm. so I'll just take a little bit and relax yeah. and then kind of evaluate go from there thanks so much it was great meeting you thanks so much yeah. huh? getting lessons with Venus is one of the top things I've ever done more p3 right after the break Welcome back. If you have a question or comment or an idea for an upcoming show, drop us an email at info at p3tv.ca. Thanks for watching. Until next time, for all of us at P3, I'm Ronald Mark. Good night.